Movie musicals seem to have a bit of a boom and bust status. Sure, they were pretty consistently massive back when they were new. Then, over time, it seemed the art form began to ebb and flow. Some decent, some great, some horrendous. Like many art forms, the genre has grown extremely fluid in quality. Stage-to-screen adaptations in particular can be super touch-and-go, given the difficulty of translating stage productions to film technique. Which is why it pleases me to say that one of the successful entries is... Okay, successful is a little overstating. It did okay at the box office, but really well with critics and in home releases, which is good enough for me. And beyond dollars, it became super ingrained in broader culture. And I may be biased considering it's one of my favorites, but I think it's easy to see why. There is nothing quite like Little Shop of Horrors. It is dark and hilarious, tragic and silly, sardonic and whimsical. In just an hour and a half, it packs in a million and one notes with catchy songs and a great cast. That being said, all of these unique elements mixing together, alongside a very science fiction plot, means it can be an acquired taste. There's a lot of suspension of disbelief necessary, and not just because there's a talking plant. Little Shop of Horrors is firmly planted <laughs> in the categories of kitsch and camp. The plot lines are farcical and quick, the set dressing is gaudy, and a lot of the key players toe the line between relatable and flat-out caricature. It's almost like a living cartoon, which shouldn't be too surprising given that this was directed by Frank Oz. Yes, that Frank Oz. Yes, that Frank Oz. But it shouldn't be too surprising when I put forward my theory that Little Shop is probably one of the darkest musicals around. Just not for the reasons everyone thinks. Yeah, I know, musical about murder and a plant that eats people, of course that's darker than newsies. But I'm not talking about that. The scariest part of Little Shop of Horrors isn't the gore, or the murder, or even Steve Martin doing this. Say, ah! It's all the stuff that fills in the space around it. The stuff that's not really said. If you've never seen the stage show or the movie, like, go do that. Seriously, c come on. It's October, man. Go, go get creepy with it. Watch it and then come back. No, no. Watch this once. G go watch the movie. Then watch this again. That's better for my view hours. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyway, the musical follows Seymour Krelborn, a hapless wretch of the 1960s who does drudge work at a flower shop in the most derelict part of downtown New York, known as Skid Row. He's head over heels for his beautiful co-worker Audrey and under the thumb of his merciless boss, Mr. Mushnick. The crux of the plot revolves around him adopting an alien plant that he names Audrey II, which subsequently grows large by drinking his blood and attracts plenty of attention to the store, bringing in a lot of money. It reaches a point where Audrey too begins to speak and outright tells Seymour that it will only grow further if it's fed human flesh. With Audrey too being a meal ticket for both himself and Audrey, Seymour begins a killing streak in the name of maintaining his way out of Skid Row. The ending... depends on what you're watching, but that's a different story. Kind of. The moral of Little Shop of Horrors is simple. Be careful what you wish for. Seymour wants a better life, and he commits horrible sins to achieve it, and... Again, depending on which you are watching, pays the price for it. But then the question arises, what would have become of Seymour if none of this had happened in the first place? I don't mean that in some alternate timeline theorizing kind of way. WHAT WOULD HAPPEN?! I mean, this musical does not have a sunny outlook on life at all. The stage is set, literally and figuratively, quite neatly in the main opening number, Skid Row. Crystal, Ronette, and Chiffon paint a picture of the neighborhood, a dark and dour place where people work dead-end jobs for little money and uncaring rich bosses. They go home to crappy houses, or no house at all, and every day is worse than the last. This is the maelstrom Seymour and Audrey are trapped in and cannot escape from. But at the same time, they're seemingly the only sympathetic figures in that storm. The movie's version of this scene is typically more expansive than stage productions, with a large ensemble helping to fill out the landscape of Skid Row more comprehensively. And it's not a charitable interpretation. There's a little bit of disconnect here, mostly because we're dealing with the main characters. We're told pretty easily that Seymour and Audrey are in horrendous circumstances, praying and begging for any way out, in desperation so intense that it leads mild-mannered Seymour to kill and butcher. But as the camera pans around Skid Row and you get a look at the place, their neighbors aren't painted nearly as kind. They're surly and gross and dirty. The kind of caricature of the poor you'd see from, I don't know, someone really out of touch, someone really mean. 
maybe a movie star, maybe a movie star turned politician. I, I can't think of a person who'd fit the bill. I, you'll have to use your imagination. It's almost as if the movie is trying to raise Seymour and Audrey from the unwashed masses in the name of making them stick out. They're not like all these other slobs. They're nice and cute and trying their best. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think Frank Oz or Howard Ashman hate poor people or anything like that. I just think this is a very cartoonish movie, drawing on cartoonish portrayals as shorthand. This is the same treatment every character in the film gets in one way or another. It's a deliberate stylistic choice. But it does set the tone. Yeah, Skid Row sucks. And that's about it. This isn't Dorothea Lange photographing migrants in the Depression. This is a Looney Tune. This veneer is crucial because without it, the story that unfolds is almost indigestible. Seymour's main conflict stems, ha 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 ha, from his desire to get both him and Audrey, who was a victim of both poverty and domestic violence, out of Skid Row and into a comfortable life. Now, the emphasis here is on comfortable. Audrey has a whole number where she details the life she wants, and it's not exactly a big ask. Let's see what's on the docket. Okay, uh, a house, food, a bed, a television, cleanliness, not being miserable. This seems like pretty basic stuff. The kind of stuff some might argue every person is entitled to. That exaggerated framework really comes into play here, as the sequence is, for lack of a better term, Disney-fied, complete with cutesy cartoon birds and Technicolor landscape. The joke here is that this is her fantasy, but it's all so simple. The problem is that this irony becomes increasingly less funny the more it becomes everyday reality for an ever-growing amount of people. Anecdotally, as a working adult born in 1994, I know no one who owns a home. Several people I know don't even live alone. In terms of hard evidence, things seem even more dire. A 2019 study states that almost 70% of millennials can't afford a home. And this was pre-pandemic. Asking for a little is asking for a lot. In the stage version of Somewhere That's Green, Audrey insists she wouldn't want to live somewhere fancy, like Levittown. Which, good choice, because rent there is now about... <laughs> Seymour's ambitions aren't laid out so specifically, though we do get the idea that he's a little bigger in his goals. But only a bit. During Feed Me, when he makes the pivotal decision to murder Audrey's abusive boyfriend to help Audrey too continue to grow, he's presented by Tui, that's what they call the plant, with promises of a glamorous life full of untold riches and fame. The thing is though, Seymour doesn't really seem that interested. From an outside perspective, one might get the impression that Little Shop of Horrors is about an innocent guy who gets drunk on fame and wealth and abandons his morals over it. But really, Seymour never becomes a bad guy apart from his murder, which is Okay, mur murder's bad. It's bad. Don't don't do it. But for what it's worth, Seymour is always bothered by it. Nothing that Tui gives him in exchange for his killing makes him happy because his conscience is always needling him. During the number the meek shall inherit, he's inundated with the fame and glory he was told that he'd have. He gets exactly what he wants, and he's pretty miserable. He can't live with himself. The only thing that motivates him to do any of this at all is that he wants to help Audrey, because he loves her and he wants her to be happy. The only reason he does what Tui wants at all is because he sees how he can use the situation to get Audrey away from Orin, her boyfriend. For a movie absolutely bathed in caricature and cartoony representation, this is a surprisingly fraught example of a good guy gone bad. Which makes sense. Seymour's our protagonist. If anyone's gonna have layers, it's him. Now let's talk about those two endings. The long and short of it is, in the movie, Seymour defeats Tui, and he and Audrey escape to that green place she dreams about. Let's go suburbs, yay suburbs! <laughs> in the original musical, however, and in the director's cut of the film, Tui eats Audrey and Seymour and takes over the world with its alien plan of domination. The latter is, as far as I'm concerned, the true ending. While it hurts to see Seymour and Audrey suffer, this is the vehicle for the moral. And it isn't subtle, either. As Tui takes over the planet, the company sings in unison. They may offer you fortune and fame, love and money and instant acclaim, but whatever they offer you, don't feed the plants. Okay, simple enough. But the real depressing element kicks in a couple lines later. The song closes with this. But whatever they offer you, though they're slopping the trough for you, please, whatever they offer you, don't feed the plants. There goes that cynical gaze again, we're all just farm animals getting slopped from the trough. Mm -mm -mm. Seymour and people like him are farm animals, drawn to the slop and the glitz and the fame. 
But is Seymour ever that taken in by glory and money? In The Meek Shall Inherit, he can't even seem to convince himself, no matter how much he reminds himself he stands to gain. Stick with that plant and gee, my bank account will thrive. What am I saying? No way, forget it. It's much too dangerous to keep that plant alive. I take these offers. That means more killing. Who knew success would come with messy, nasty strings? I sign these contracts. That means I'm willing to keep on doing bloody, awful, evil things. The glamour doesn't convince him. What does is Audrey. He relies on Tui to keep them out of poverty, and he fears that without it, and the reputability of his fame, she'll walk away from him. During the opening number, Seymour is desperate to get out, but he also doesn't seem to think he deserves anything better. He views himself as a miserable slob who doesn't know what he's existing for. Because the show is so short, we don't really get to know much about Seymour. Little Shop is deeply practical. The movie is an hour and a half, and the musical version two hours without intermission. Both of these are decidedly on the shorter end of their mediums. Because of this, it won't show you anything that doesn't further the plot or the motivations of the characters. It doesn't really have time to. So what do we know about Seymour? Well, what's vital to the plot? He's poor, he hates his life, he loves Audrey and strange plants, and he wants to escape Skid Row with his beloved. Now Seymour is the character we know the most about, which means it's all downhill from there, so to speak. All we know about Audrey, beyond her relationships with Orin and Seymour, is that she craves her green somewhere, and that childhood trauma and the cycle of poverty have led her to seek validation in love and similarly abusive men all her life. Seymour and Audrey fit each other well, because that's how the story works. His demeanor is something she's been in need of, a mellow guy who wants to treat her with love and respect. In turn, she motivates him to succeed in life at all costs in a way nothing else can. Without Audrey, Seymour has no reason to kill, and no reason to lose in the end. But would he have won if he hadn't? The message of Little Shop is clear. Seymour lost everything because he sacrificed his morals to get out of poverty. But how much can we really blame him? Because Little Shop is so sparse, there's nothing to really suggest there was any way Seymour and Audrey could have gotten out of Skid Row. Both of them established through song that they've been poor all their lives. And it's not likely that the crappy jobs they work will do anything to change that. Poverty is often a vicious cycle. If you're born with no money, you likely can't pursue higher education. And without that education, you are kept from the highest wages, and without those wages, you are kept from a lot of the basic comforts of life. A study from the National Center for Childhood Poverty indicated that 46% of 20-year-olds who were poor had spent more than half of their childhood already in poverty. The same pattern followed for 30 and 35-year-olds. This particular study focused on American children, but we see similar patterns in other countries as well. For example, in Australia. A report by the Melbourne Institute indicated that those who experienced poverty as children were over three times more likely to be poor as adults. Seymour and Audrey are caught in what's called a poverty trap, an economic theory to describe a situation where an already poor person lacks the means to escape being poor. Let's do a thought exercise. If Little Shop took place in modern New York City and Mushniks paid the basic minimum wage of $15 an hour, a 40-hour work week would mean $600 a week or $2,400 a month. The average rent for a studio apartment in Manhattan is about $3,500. Brooklyn isn't much better. And these are with some of the most charitable possible numbers. Oh yeah, and we're leaving out something kind of important here. Um, Seymour doesn't get paid. <coughs> he's stuck where he's at because Mr. Mushnick took him in as an orphan and gives him food and a place to sleep. He and Audrey are both caught in the trap, and Seymour is gnawing at his own leg. When all you've known in life is nothing, you might be surprised what people might do just to get a piece of something. For all the superficial simplicity of Little Shop, it manages to play with ambiguity pretty well. Mr. Mushnick is a jerk who mistreats Seymour massively, but also has enough care in his heart to want Audrey to leave Orin. Audrey seemingly acts out in intimate relationships to calm a storm led by endless financial and psychological turmoil. And Seymour... What is Seymour? Well, here's the thing. Little Shop isn't an original musical. It's based on a 1960 Roger Corman film of the same name. In that version, which runs at barely over an hour against the musicals too, Seymour is a little bit more of a selfish rube for Tui, here named Audrey Jr., rather than a guy in a hopeless situation trying to play his ridiculous hand. In the original, Seymour murders in very petty fashion. The dentist character, here named Dr. Farb, is accidentally killed in an altercation over flowers, rather than Seymour feeling that he can kill two birds with one stone, or I guess one dentist with gas, by getting rid of him to help Audrey. 
At one point, Junior hypnotizes him to goad him into continuing the murders, even attacking a sex worker to feed her to the plant. He suffers the fate of the original ending, eaten by the plant with a bit of a punchline. And here's the thing, 1960 Seymour isn't exactly the worst person in the world, but he is someone who you could see deserving of a bit of punishment. Rick Moranis Seymour, oh, he's just so hard to hate. He's never had a decent shot at life. His ambitions, despite his actions, aren't all about him. He doesn't care about being famous, he just wants a little piece of happiness. That makes the original ending a little harder to swallow, and might be why it went over so poorly with test audiences. Frank Oz stated that this affinity the audience develops for Audrey and Seymour, coupled with the medium of film, made the test scores tank over the ending. You don't get to see Rick Moranis and Ellen Green take a bow at the end of the movie like you would in a stage show. So you're just left stewing in the fact that these two people who've endured a life of suffering just got eaten. Is it right that Seymour and Audrey get a happy ending in the film? Well, that's obviously subjective. A purist would probably say no. But I go back and forth. When I was younger, the fake ending felt, I don't know, phoned in. This isn't the real deal. It's just a pacifier to cover up the truth. But the older I get, and the more I understand the realities of poverty and financial insecurity, the nicer it seems to imagine a world where things work out in the end for people caught in the spokes of that nasty little wheel. Little Shop is what's known as a farce. It's not the kind of movie that comforts you or warms your heart. But while a man-eating plant is scary to consider, what might be scarier yet is the fact that there are a lot of Seymours and Audreys in the world. And while they're not eaten by alien creatures, they do get chewed up and spit out without any test audiences to intervene and give them a chance. Poverty is a complicated beast, and I couldn't ever hope to wrangle it in just one video with the necessary articulation. It has long been theorized and argued that one of the biggest factors in crime is poverty. It can be a little difficult to parse the numbers on this, accounting for outstanding factors, the difference between violent and non-violent crime, location, and so on can make one-to-one -one comparison challenging. Besides, I don't think anyone is in jail for feeding people to plants. The numbers show that even more than outright impoverishment, inequality and deprivement are big drivers for crime. And Skid Row establishes this plainly. The blue-collar citizens head uptown to work for rich jerks who treat them like garbage, then go home to perfectly juxtapose the two cities. Seymour never even leaves. The fact that he has reservations at all is pretty incredible. He's got literally nothing to lose. And he loses that in the end anyway. It seems the gap between the haves and have-nots has cracked wide open and become a canyon since the 1980s when this movie came out. I'm not a political channel, so I won't bore you with theory I can't do justice to. But I will say that on a personal level, I see Seymour's every day. People who have been beat down by circumstances that they can't seem to rise up from, doing everything they can and not having it be enough. A movie has no obligation to create a utopia, or even just a world better than the one I live in, let alone a kitschy horror comedy. But when I watch Little Shop of Horrors, the scariest thing is not the blood, and the gore, and the alien invasion. It's those little echoes of the world outside of my television screen. The destitute people who deserve a better life. The women under the thumbs of violent partners. The Seymour Krellborns who just want the tiniest piece of the sky to share with someone they love. In my mind, the fake ending to Little Shop will always feel like a bit of BS. Some might even see it as an insult. A hokey lie meant to placate people who can't handle a bit of dark fun. And sometimes I agree. But sometimes... I see the appeal.